people think that goes away in April with the heat. Welcome to Planet America. I'm John Barron. And I'm Chaz Chidala. This week, the first woman to go public with concerns about Joe Biden speaks out about the Tara Reid case. We'll be looking at the state of the American economy and the plight of the unemployed. But first... Reopening, ready or not, more US states are pushing ahead with ending shutdowns and restarting businesses shuttered by the coronavirus pandemic. President Trump appeared this week in a Fox News special, America Together, returning to work from inside Washington's Lincoln Memorial. We did the right thing. We saved, I think we saved millions of lives, but now we have to get it back open. And we have to get it back open safely, but as quickly as possible. There, the president also stood by his support for the unproven drug, hydroxychloroquine, and said he was confident there will be a vaccine this year. He then flew to Arizona earlier today, his longest trip since the pandemic began. He appeared at a face mask factory without a face mask and was asked whether reopening will cost lives. It's possible there will be some because you won't be locked into an apartment or a, or a house or whatever it is. But at the same time, we're going to practice social distancing. We're going to be washing hands. We're going to be doing a lot of the things that we've learned to do over the last period of time. Meanwhile, Vice President Mike Pence says the White House Coronavirus Task Force, which he heads, may ramp up by the end of the month, Chaz. And meanwhile, the number of deaths went past 72,000 today, which was what the IHME model has been projecting would be the total number of deaths by August. So now they've changed their projection to 134 thousand deaths by August. Regardless, many Americans are gradually returning to their normal lives. 40 states are opening up a bit more this week, and even if they weren't, Americans are voting with their feet anyway. Apple's mobility data makes it clear that unlike Italy or the UK, America is starting to move again. They apparently have had enough of being locked up causing those who want people to stay home to resort to increasingly desperate tactics. I'm going to step out of the frame and hand him the mic so he can explain why he's here and why he is dressed the way that he is. Daniel? Thank you. Yeah, I'm here today to try to make a point that we need to, I think it's premature that we open our beaches. They should just take a leaf out of Sweden's playbook where one mayor opted to keep people from crowding in the park by dumping tons of chicken manure in it. To sit in a park that stinks of chicken manure is not a pleasant experience, said the town mayor. However, it is good for the lawns. Those Swedes are full of ideas, John. Yeah, not one of their better ones, though. <laughs> Former US Vice President Joe Biden broke his silence this week on claims he sexually assaulted a member of his Senate staff in the early 1990s. The presumptive Democratic presidential nominee was asked about Tara Reid's allegations by MSNBC's Mika Brzezinski. She says in 1993, Mr. Vice President, that you pinned her against the wall and reached under her clothing and penetrated her with your fingers. Would you please go on the record with the American people? Did you sexually assault Tara Reid? No, it is not true. I'm saying unequivocally, it never, never happened. And it didn't. It never happened. Biden also says he's unaware of any complaint of this nature against him by Tara Reid or anyone else. But he says if there was a complaint, it would now be with the National Archives. The, I, 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 I'm not worried about it at all. If there is a complaint, that's where it would be. That's where it would be filed. And if it's there, put it out. But I've never seen it. No one has that I'm aware of. So it might seem pretty straightforward then, but it's not. If there is a complaint, the National Archives says it would remain under the control of the United States Senate. A Senate resolution requires such personnel records remain out of public view for 50 years. But there's also doubt about who would really have it anyway, if indeed it exists. First, the National Archives said it did not possess the records. It said they were maintained by the Senate. Under Senate rules, those documents would in fact be maintained by the General Services Administration, which is a federal agency that helps manage other agencies. But the GSA says it keeps its records with the National Archives. We're back to square one. Biden has written to the Secretary of the Senate asking them to release any files relating to these allegations, Chairs. Yeah, and then the Secretary wrote back saying no 
They have no discretion to disclose any such information under the law. Meanwhile, Tara Reid says the report she filed with the Congressional Personnel Office did not explicitly accuse Biden of sexual assault or even harassment anyway. Yes, although what Reid says is in her complaint describes harassment, at least, even if she didn't use the actual word. Biden, though, is refusing to allow access to his personal archives, which are housed at the University of Delaware. He says no personnel records are in there but lots of records of conversations with world leaders and speeches and things that could be distracting in a presidential campaign are there. At the same time, the lawyer who headed the two-month vetting process of Joe Biden before he became Barack Obama's running mate in 2008 says the allegations never surfaced during their investigation. This is Bill Jeffress who says they presented everything they found to Obama and he selected Biden because there was nothing serious. And senior advisor to Obama, David Axelrod, confirmed the campaign found no formal complaint, no informal chatter about Biden, and certainly no intimation of sexual harassment or assault from Reid or anyone else. Yeah, Biden may well be right that his documents don't include employee records. Searching for the complaint may also be a pointless exercise because Reid supporters like journalist Katie Halper have already suggested Biden will unseal his records and there won't be anything in them because if there had been, why would they keep the complaint? So we're off to another potential Obama birth certificate scenario then. But... If you're going to carry on like this to defend yourself... Look, this is an open book. There's nothing for me to hide. Then you need to act like you've got nothing to hide, which means opening up your records to an independent auditor or lawyer to look for Tara Reid-related material, even if there is no chance of the complaint being there, especially given people from Biden's campaign have already accessed his document collection since Biden's campaign began. So we know they can do it. I don't think the press are going to let this go, John. I really don't. Like the New York Times this week, who said that any investigation must include the records Biden donated to the Uni of Delaware. Also, they called for an unbiased, apolitical panel to look into the documents. Mind you, Biden isn't the only one facing questions right now. Tara Reid's interviews from 2019 are also attracting attention. Not so much because she was at that stage only accusing Biden of sexual harassment, but it was more how she was talking about Biden. Like, for instance, she said, this is not a story about sexual misconduct. It's a story about abuse of power. And so some have suggested that's an odd way to speak about someone you believe committed sexual assault, although that is a common phrase used about sexual misconduct. Also, she said, I wasn't scared of him, that he was going to take me in a room or anything. It wasn't that kind of vibe. Some have also suggested that's a weird thing to say about a person who assaulted you. You make up your own mind. The other issue Reid has is that her strongest witness is currently anonymous. According to this friend back in 1993, Reid told her on multiple occasions about physical interactions with then Senator Biden that made Reid uncomfortable. She also says Reid told her in detail that she had been sexually assaulted by Biden and that Reid had told her within days of it happening. So she was told both stories in real detail and not in 1995 at the time they happened. Furthermore, this friend says she's the one who encouraged Reid to only publicly share her allegation of sexual harassment, not the assault, when Reid came forward in 2019. Although she admits in hindsight that was probably bad advice. That's all pretty important stuff to corroborate Reid's story, John, so I suspect there's going to be some pressure soon to find out a little bit more about this friend. Yeah, well, let's speak to somebody now who has found themselves somewhat at the centre of a lot of these allegations. Joining us is Lucy Flores. In 2014, she was the Democratic Party's nominee for Lieutenant Governor of Nevada when she says that Joe Biden approached her from behind at a campaign rally, placed his hands on her shoulders, sniffed her hair and slowly kissed her head. Last year, Lucy wrote about how uncomfortable the encounter made her feel and in response, a number of women then came forward with similar claims. Among those women was Tara Reid. Lucy Flores, welcome to Planet America. Thank you. At this point, do you believe that Joe Biden sexually assaulted Tara Reid? 
I believe Tara Reid, yes, I do. We have Tara Reid's accusation, we have Joe Biden's denial. 27 years on, where does that leave us? Of course, it leaves us in a bind in that we could never truly determine if something is true or not. And so you do have to make your own best judgment. Now, in this situation, we are in such a bad place because we are left with these two options. Joe Biden is the presumptive nominee for president for the Democratic Party in the United States versus Donald Trump, who arguably, and I certainly agree, is a horrible choice. He is not the alternative that I think anyone wants to choose. And, and so it is that adds to the level of difficulty in someone trying to actually just make a determination for themselves about what to do in this particular case. It, it's really quite awful. Lucy, the lawyers who vetted Joe Biden for vice president in 2008 say they did a very thorough job. They came up with nothing at all about Tara Reid and there was not a whiff of scandal, nothing of this nature at all. Joe Biden's defenders say there is no pattern of sexual assault or sexual misconduct. What do you say to them? 12 years ago, Me Too didn't exist. 12 years ago, flags that might have been raised were not, probably not raised. That type of vetting occurred in a much different time than we are now. Um, the fact that he, his behavior around the way he treated, uh, the way he handled the Clarence Thomas hearings, um, his positions on segregation, uh, lots of problematic things that have come out now um, weren't flagged. And if they were flagged, people didn't think much of it. So, but times are different. And just because he was vetted in a much, much different time 12 years ago does not mean that that is a vetting that would have resulted in the same outcome so many years later. There seems to be a transition going on within the Democratic Party at the moment from believe all women to respect all women, listen to all women, but then subject their allegations to scrutiny. Do you think that's a healthy transition or do you think it's a negative one? I, I actually believe that it's a healthy one because it does move us away from a catchphrase. I think that Believe Women was very unfortunately hijacked by many politically motivated people who had political ends. And, and there wasn't a deep commitment, there wasn't a deep policy commitment to, to actually changing the culture around sexual assault survivors and women who come out with their stories. And it was very easy to hop on this bandwagon and never give it a second thought. Whereas now people are having to backtrack and they're having to force, um, we are forcing this conversation because now folks are having to explain what many would consider very apparent hypocrisies, in, including Joe Biden's himself. Um, where it was very easy for him to say the the essence we should consider the essence of what women's stories are and the the cauldron that they voluntarily put themselves into, and yet somehow that doesn't apply to Tara Reid. Lucy, what do you feel people don't understand about Tara Reid's story that they really should? I think what the biggest the biggest issue that I see with folks who who don't believe her or um, who are trying to poke holes in her story is that they are swayed by what their concept of a quote unquote perfect survivor looks like. She doesn't match all of these criteria, therefore she's not credible. And I think we really have to get out of this knee jerk reaction that we have to compare um, the way in which women tell their stories and recognize that every single one of them is unique. Lucy Flores, thanks for visiting Planned America. My pleasure. Thank you. The formal search is now on for Joe Biden's vice presidential running mate. He said he will nominate a woman and dozens of candidates are reportedly under consideration. For a long time, the Vice President of the United States was more like an understudy, waiting in the wings in case they were ever called upon to become the most powerful person in America, but unless or until then, having little to do. Woodrow Wilson's Vice President, Thomas Marshall, joked in 1913 about the obscurity of the office. Once there were two brothers, one ran away to sea, the other was elected 
vice president, and nothing was ever heard from either of them again. Even when President Wilson suffered a stroke, Marshall didn't take over his duties. First Lady Edith Wilson communicated the president's decisions. Many think she made them. There was good reason for the vice president to be kept at arm's length. Until 1804, they weren't chosen by the president. They were the candidate who came second in the election. A consolation prize for the runner-up. 1804 was also the year Vice President Aaron Burr shot Alexander Hamilton. And unlike when another VP, Dick Cheney, shot a guy 202 years later, it was on purpose, in a duel, and proved fatal for Hamilton. Even in the 1930s, Franklin Roosevelt was lumbered with a party rival as VP, Texan Cactus Jack Garner, who famously said of the Vice Presidency, "...is not worth a warm bucket of piss." So irrelevant was the vice president, there wasn't even a mechanism to replace a VP before 1967 when the 25th Amendment passed. Until then, the job had been left vacant for a total of 50 years. In 1945, even though he knew he was suffering heart failure, Franklin Roosevelt didn't tell his VP, Harry Truman, anything about the Manhattan Project developing the atomic bomb. Over the White House at Washington, the flag flies at half-staff as a grief-stricken nation mourns the death of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, President of the United States. Inside, in the historic cabinet room, Vice President Harry S. Truman takes the oath of office as 32nd President. Truman was suddenly in charge of a war effort and the most powerful weapon ever built. Within weeks, he had to make the momentous decision to use it. The tradition of keeping VPs in the dark and at a distance continued up until the 1960s. John F. Kennedy and his VP, Lyndon Johnson, were former rivals who could basically hardly stand each other. JFK and his Attorney General brother Bobby ridiculed Lyndon Johnson and gave him very little to do, but it was Kennedy's assassination in November 1963 that started to change things. Vice President Lyndon Johnson <clears throat> has left the hospital in uh, Dallas, but we do not know uh, to where he has proceeded. When LBJ became president, he had no VP. If anything had happened to Johnson, who'd already suffered at least one heart attack by then, the Speaker of the House, John McCormick, would have become president. That was until Hubert Humphrey was elected VP in 1964. Three years later, the 25th Amendment finally set out presidential and vice-presidential succession once and for all. In the Cold War, it was clear America needed somebody not just ready to take the reins of power, but also somebody to help carry the load of governing. So when VP Spiro Agnew resigned in 1973, he was replaced by Jerry Ford. And when Nixon resigned in 1974, he was replaced by Jerry Ford, who appointed Nelson Rockefeller as his VP. And since then, VPs have grown in power and influence. More of a co-president than vice president, although recent VEPs haven't got a good record of becoming president. In fact, in the past half century, only one current or former VP has won the White House in their own right. It was George Bush in 1988. Joe Biden, who first ran for president himself that year, is hoping to join what is an elite group. So help me God. Out of context, at the Trump Town Hall, the Trump family announced they decided to pay taxes this year. We did the right thing, but we never want to have to do it again. The president weighs in on when keeping up with the Kardashians will finally end. I hope it's going to be very soon, because I'm seeing things that I don't like seeing. Trump promises no more Stormy Daniels scandals. Now he's discovered Pornhub. I will say this. It's wonderful to watch people over a... Uh, a laptop. And Trump is still upset after losing a game of musical chairs. All of a sudden they have half the number of seats. That was the Trump Town Hall. I don't want to do this forever. Well, things are starting to get real as far as the economic side of this crisis goes. Last week we saw GDP shrink by 4.8% in the first quarter, even though COVID barely overlapped with it. IHS Market projects next quarter's GDP to shrink by about 27%.
Strangely, almost half of that first quarter decline in GDP can be attributed to reduced healthcare operations, even during a pandemic. You see, they put a hold on all the highly profitable elective procedures. Even more of an issue, though, is consumer spending. Now, that accounts for about 67% of total GDP. That dropped 7.5% in March, which you can see is five times what the drop was at the height of the GFC. Although the good news is that while people aren't spending so much, they are saving. And that's creating a little money ball that could be dropped sometime later this year to get the economy going again. What people are waiting for now, though, is April's unemployment rate. We learn what that's going to be late on Friday night. Economists are expecting it to be about 16%, although DRW Trading estimates that the real number of jobless Americans could be between 32 and 70 million, wide range, representing between 20 and 45% of the workforce. Ironically, those who've kept their jobs are working three hours a day longer than they were before the lockdown. So no one's happy at the moment. But you might be thinking, this is so bad. All those unemployed people are getting huge COVID benefits checks, aren't they? Well, about that. Big, beautiful world. Okay, so we've just seen all kinds of apocalyptic graphs and here is one more for you. This is the percentage of the labour force on unemployment benefits. 12.2%. Hang on, 12.2% on benefits? That's not that crazy. It's not 30 or 40% out of work, is it? Well, this was two weeks ago. But note, even at the height of the GFC, only 4.7% were collecting unemployment benefits then. So what's going on? Well. This has been happening the whole crisis. Back in March, only 29% of unemployed Americans were receiving benefits. By mid-April, an estimated 6.2 million Americans who had applied for benefits still hadn't received their first payment. And even today, a notoriously stingy state like Florida has only paid out, oh, hang on, oh, hang on. oh yeah, thanks, 25% of claims. And remember, Right now, pretty much every claim is supposed to be paid out, but 25%. Unfortunately, America's benefit structure kind of sucks. Firstly, there's all the usual causes for system failure. They rely on 40-year-old computer systems. Websites crash continuously. Phone lines are jamming for hours on end. Ohio had to build their COVID payment system from scratch. People couldn't even apply for it until two weeks ago, and payments won't start until mid-May, two months after they shut down the state. But the biggest problem is many of these systems have been set up to fail. You see, in America, employers pay for unemployment insurance through state taxes. So the states try to reduce those tax rates as much as they can, usually by creating all kinds of conditions designed to stop people qualifying for benefits. Like for instance, you can't have quit. You have to have been fired through no fault of your own. You had to have worked for most of the last 12 months. You can't be self-employed or a business owner and you must be searching for a full-time job, not a part-time job, and you've got to be able to prove it sometimes several times a week through incredibly inconvenient bureaucratic methods. The net result of all this is that while these states here pay unemployment benefits to about half the unemployed, with Massachusetts paying out the most, 56%, America on average only usually pays 29% of unemployed people benefits. And these states here, they're another matter altogether. Uh, by the way, Florida and North Carolina always seem to be at the bottom of these lists. And the absolute worst in this case is Mississippi, paying out benefits to only 9.2% of the unemployed people. The system in these states here is built to deny claims, not to pay them. So it's hard to just change things like that when a virus hits. And it doesn't end there. Even when you can manage to get unemployment benefits in America, there's a hard limit on how long you can claim them for. The most generous state, Montana, with a 28-week maximum for unemployment benefits. And then you've got 40 states on 26 weeks, but then you've got these states, with of course, Florida and North Carolina down the bottom, with only a 12-week maximum for unemployment benefits. After that, you're screwed. But 
don't get too cocky there, Australia, because while these are the maximum weekly unemployment payments from the stingiest states, and yes, $235 a week from Mississippi, that doesn't look good. But this is what the brand spanking new job seeker allowance pays in Australia. And of course, that's Australian dollars. At current exchange rates, that's actually 181 American dollars or 191 dollars with purchasing power parity, comparing apples with apples. And that there is significantly lower than the stingiest American state. So just bear that in mind, okay? Right, enough bearing in mind. But what happens to those Americans who don't qualify for benefits? Well, if you've got a poor family with children, especially if you're a single parent or you can't work for some reason, you might qualify for TAMF or Temporary Assistance for Needy Families. The bad news though is that most states are even stingier with TAMF than they are with unemployment insurance. Even the generous states here, they only provide money to about 40% of families under the poverty line, apart from California. But check out the other end of the scale. That is not good. Louisiana and Texas only provide support for 4% of the families under the poverty line. So yes, sort out whatever's going on with the special corona support payments, but spare a thought for the people who are struggling every day, because there might be more of them than you think. Big, beautiful world. A month ago, we reported on the fears for the safety of America's prison population of over 2 million during this pandemic. Well, things are pretty bad, and the known infection rate is about two and a half times that of the general population. But that is almost certainly a massive underestimate. Eight of the ten largest outbreaks in the country have been at correctional facilities. Now, of the 157 confirmed cases, 122 are inmates that are still here at the jail. So far, 230 detainees have tested positive. 365 prisoners and 99 staff at that facility. According to the Lancet Medical Journal, there are currently 378 cases of COVID-19 in New York City's prison population alone. That's around 10%. But prisoners are not being routinely tested. Among prison and jail employees who can get tests more easily, there are almost 1,000 COVID cases. At one prison where they are doing mass testing of prisoners in Marion, Ohio, of the 2,500 prisoners, 2,000 have tested positive to COVID-19, an 80% infection rate. You know, I still have not left my dorm yet. I'm still too scared to go out. In North Carolina, they've only tested 2% of all prisoners, but at the one facility where they've done mass testing, the Noose Correctional Institution, the infection rate is nearly 60%. At the notoriously overcrowded Rikers Island in New York, the infection rate is five times that the rest of the city, 30 times the national average. It's the setting that they're in. I've been to Rikers Island, I've seen what it's like. You cannot contain this in Rikers Island. And remember, over half a million Americans are in local jails without having been convicted of any crime. They can't afford to post the median bail of $10,000. Many are accused of offences that don't even carry jail terms. Another half million are in for non-violent drug offences. And the increasing rates of infection in states like Texas are simply astronomical. To date, more than 1,000 inmates have tested positive for COVID-19. Compare that to three positive inmates a month ago. That's more than a 37,000% increase. But there is a bit of good news. Those who can't post bail or are back in jail for parole violations are among the most likely to be released to avoid infection. In LA County, they've reduced the prison population by around 5,000 or 30%, mostly pre-trial older prisoners and those with pre-existing medical conditions. The reductions in the number of prisoners varies widely though from around 7% in South Carolina to over 40% in Colorado. In some cases governors are granting early release to prisoners due out within 90 days. In other cases judges are setting no bail or lower bail amounts, non-custodial sentences or deferring weekend detention. Still between one and a half and two million Americans remain in prison and the death toll continues to mount. But right now, nobody seems to know how many inmates have actually died.
Today we learned a second inmate at the James T. Vaughn Correctional Center near Smyrna has died from the virus. Here's his online death notification. Nothing from ADC about the cause and certainly nothing about coronavirus. If the prisoners have it today, staff will have it tomorrow and people in the community will have it the day after that. Yeah, as you say, John, it's impossible to know just how many prisoners have this thing given the lack of testing. But the Marshall Centre have done their darndest. They've found 14,500 prison corona cases and 217 corona deaths. Undoubtedly, though, as you say, a massive undercount. Also, you mentioned America's biggest corona clusters were in jails. Well, it's not just the top 10. 25 of the biggest 40 COVID clusters in America are in prisons or jails. And by the way, 33 of the top 40 are either in prisons or meat processing plants. And for those who don't care what happens to prisoners, well, remember this. 200,000 people check into jails every week and 200,000 people leave every week. So this is like an engine for spreading COVID. America is not going to control COVID until they control it in the prisons. And that is all for this week. We will see you for another trip to Planet America, 9.30pm next Wednesday night on ABC TV. And we'll be having a fireside chat on ABC News at 8.15 Eastern Time on Friday night. There's also more on Facebook, YouTube and iView. See you there. Good night.